Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. What not to do? When we talk about enterprise architecture and look for guidance or seek advice ourselves, it's relatively straightforward to end up with a list of do this and do that, from how to set up your enterprise architecture practice, to uh, what artifacts to create, where to store them, what governance mechanisms to employ, etc. In fact, there's loads of information out there. Yet, if you ask people who've been on the receiving end of enterprise architecture what the issues are that they have with it, there's plenty of anti-patterns we'd wish to avoid. We recognise them. The no-shop, the ivory tower, heavy-handed governance meetings, slow delayed decision-making processes, stuff like that. Yet, although we recognise all of these as common practices, no one has ever said these were the habits that we should adopt. There's no document anywhere that states you should aim to become an ivory tower, for example. So why do they persist and why so often? Partly it's measures and metrics, but also partly as we don't spend enough time trying to design these practices out. A focus on what not to do should be as keenly sought out as what to do. Welcome everybody to Toolkit Tuesday special edition. Uh, I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's great to have you. Um, uh, whatever time of day you're joining us or, or evening, we do have a global audience here. And um, with that in mind, please do uh, tell us where you're joining us from in the chat if you uh, have the opportunity. Um, it's uh, it's great to see where you're all from. He Hello from Los Angeles. That's great. I see one coming in now. So um, welcome. Um, thank you for our opening video uh, to Mr. Paul Homan um, of IBM. And... Um, what not to do yes um good advice as usual with paul and i did note that you have your bubble head on the shelf there paul so um uh, a new uh, uh a, a new addition to uh, what's behind you in the videos but uh the, great to have the ea minute videos thank you paul um a quick moment of housekeeping a quick item before we get going uh if you have questions for our speakers today, then uh, please put those, if you can, in the Q&A channel. Um, not everyone is uh, that familiar with WebEx, but uh, you'll find the Q&A channel if you don't, if it's not there already. Uh, if you click on the uh, little dots in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, that will pop up an option to click on Q&A. And please, um, I'll, I'll ask the questions of the speakers uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, but please put them in there if you can, but use the chat channel for any other activity, um, letting us know where you're from, messages to other um, um, participants today, or whatever you want to do, comments uh, in the chat, but uh, please reserve the questions for Q&A. So with that uh, housekeeping item done, uh, let's move on. Today we are actually focused on uh, something a little different for us here at uh, Talk It Tuesday. We're focused on uh, energy emissions. Uh, and we have a group here at the Open Group called the Open Footprint Forum, which recently released a snapshot of uh, our Open Footprint data model. And uh, we're going to be looking today at uh, what impact that data model and other deliverables from the forum uh, are expected to have on the management of emissions data, including a significant reduction in effort and expense associated with this activity. So this group of people is doing really useful stuff uh, in the forum, and uh, it's about time you all heard about it because uh, it's something that affects all of us. So joining us today, as you can see on the slide, I have my colleague Jim Hytella, who is Vice President of Sustainability and Market Development here at the Open Group. 
uh, Sam Salim, who is the Data and Digital Project Manager at Corporate Mission Data and Reporting with ExxonMobil uh, in uh, uh, Houston, Texas. Bertrand Ryu, who is the Director of Two Ravens Energy and Climate Consulting. And joining us for uh, Q&A, we have my, uh, another colleague of mine, Heidi Carlson, who is the Director of the Open Footprint Forum uh, with the Open Group. So they've lots they want to tell you about. Uh, I'll get out of the way so that they can. And I'm going to hand over now to Jim first, I think. Jim and Bertrand, but Jim first. Welcome. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so uh, we're going to try and give you a quick tour of the Open Footprint Forum. Um, I will talk, I'll give a little bit of an overview uh, to, to lead things off. Uh, Bertrand is going to follow uh, describing how the Open Footprint data model is structured and some of the priority use cases uh, for use of the model. Uh, Sam will talk through the roadmap looking forward. Uh, and then, as Steve mentioned, we'll have a Q&A uh, with all of us, uh, plus Heidi, to uh, answer any questions that you have. So, uh, you know, to answer the question, what is the Open Footprint Forum? The forum was created uh, four years ago to uh, focus on building a standard data model for emissions data. Uh, at that time, there were a number of other organizations, standards organizations, doing kind of the pioneering work in uh, emissions data. Uh, organizations like the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, WBCSD, and ISO, uh, and they were doing good work, but we saw a gap in terms of there not being a standard that would help companies to operationalize uh, some of that, um, some of those definitions and things inside of companies' IT systems, um, and uh, importantly, throughout their value chains, uh, which is what Scope 3 emissions is all about. Uh, so the open footprint with Forum was formed at that time to deliver a standard data model along with a reference implementation, APIs, uh, and associated documentation to address that need. Um, and uh, this work is uh, aligned with and uh, builds upon the work of those other standards organizations. Uh, a big milestone that was achieved last month by the forum, we published a snapshot of the Open Footprint data model standard. Um, that snapshot is out on the Open Group Library. You can download it there. Uh, and thank you to all of our members who, uh, who made that happen. So uh, the data model is intended to be uh, a universal, jointly developed and agreed uh, data footprint standard applicable to all industries. Um, and you know, the goal at the bottom there is to help reduce time and uh, resources wasted just on the aggregation of that data. Uh, so the companies can focus on uh, not just reporting, but also leveraging the data to create additional value for themselves. So, uh, you know, one of the things that's really driving activity in this area is regulations. They are constantly changing. Um, new regulations and requirements are coming from various countries uh, continually. Uh, and for organizations that haven't historically had to deal with emissions data in the normal course of their business, this is a big change. Um, I won't dive into details of the regulations here, but there's two key points that I wanted to pull out. Uh, the first is that if you look at any of these regulations, the filing dates are, are out in the future, uh, but most of them look back 12 to 18 months in terms of the data. Uh, so the time to be really thinking about and coming up with a plan for dealing with emissions data really is right now. Um, and the second uh, point that I would pull out here is that um, the ideal state that organizations are realizing they'd like to get to is collect data once and report against all of these relevant regulation, regulations and reporting frameworks, um, which, which makes the data management challenge uh, all the more important. So, Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what we think the benefits of, of this effort will be, um, you know, the Open Footprint Forum will, uh, you know, work to standardize the data model architecture and APIs, uh, providing benefits like easier data transfer between companies, um, unlocking value from the data, uh, and allowing for the creation of a, a large ecosystem of uh, products and services based upon the Open Footprint Standard uh, for developers to target. So, uh, so that's one set of uh, benefits. Uh, also, just 
the notion of maintaining the currency of the data model with regulations over time. So keeping it, it fresh as new regulations come out. Um, the benefit there, if you're not a company that's dealt with emissions or does it day in and day out, is that you can leverage the collective knowledge of a set of emissions regulatory experts who are working in the forum uh, to turn those regulations and the requirements into things that need to be captured and represented in the data model. Uh, and then finally, with providing an open source reference implementation as a part of this work, uh, you know, some of the benefits there are that you can leverage the innovation of many software developers, uh, and we think that it helps lower the barrier and, and ease access for smaller companies uh, to get into this. So uh, before I hand over to Bertrand, I'll, I'll try and tie this back to the theme of these webinars, which is the Enterprise Architects Toolkit, uh, a data model for emissions data along with APIs and reference implementation are very much things that need to be in an EA's toolkit these days uh, as they try to chart a path towards creating a data strategy that works for you know, what is really a new area for most businesses. So uh, just making that connection. And with that, let me hand it over to Bertrand. Thanks, Jim, and uh, hello to the, all our attendees. Uh, so I'm going to give a very quick overview of some of the top-level requirements and priorities that the forum has set um, as far as updating the model and now working on its, its actual implementation. Um, one of our my, main priorities has really been alignment with the, you know, emerging set of reporting requirements that Jim has alluded to. Right, they're, they're quite rapidly evolving from a variety of jurisdictions, from the Euro European Union, the European Commission CSRD, uh, through to you know California and state level acts uh, in the U.S. Um, really, what we we've done here, and this is a condensation of a, of a of a much more tense or technical body of work, is capturing some common reporting boundary requirements. Really set the stage for how we structure the data model. Um, and we can break these down into four areas. First is the organizational, where we're looking at the ownership structure and the various consolidation approaches that are recommended or applied to a particular, you know, reporting or report generation exercise. So, you know, things like operational and financial control or equity-based reporting. Um, the second here at the top in blue is geopolitical. Now, this is both, you know, where is the data reside from a, a legal jurisdiction or say a country or regional perspective, which is really crucial, right? I may only have to report data from a, very, a specific geopolitical area, but also what are the legal specific um, requirements, right? For a legal jurisdiction. How do I make my data tra traceable, transparent and audible? These are really detailed areas that we've looked at building, building out the data model to address these requirements. And obviously the, the facilitating the internal data verification and external assurance. Um, the second part uh, is on, or the third part would be on components and types. How do we break down the emissions data um, into various scopes and categories? The activity types, is it a source or sink, right? This sort of, you know, uh, balanced accounting for, for emissions. And then obviously different regulations will target various components. And the last and, and very crucial are the period and frequency representations for various elements in the data model. What is our temporal resolution? Things like current period, when I'm reporting, what's the base period that I'm reporting against? These are often required um, in different, in different, um, under different regulations and obviously previous and historic periods. Um, so with this uh, sort of high level view, right? And these various requirements, um, we can then, we've started building sample data sets to look at how you would apply this to data model. This is an example at a very high level of facility statement, you know, how we can start characterizing data with these various elements boundaries, so to, so to speak, um, in, the, in the structured data. Um, and then we can go further down to start breaking it down by organizational structure. What do I control versus what do I have, say, a joint venture partner or an equity stake in something, which is crucial for, for you know, what, constructing a report under various uh, legal, you know, in various legal jurisdictions and regulatory structures. Um, and also breaking down the data, not, not just, you know, by my organizational structure, but what are the specific activities? What are the specific parameters that went into the activity that were then used to derive statements, right? The actual quantities of emissions that I'm reporting in an emissions reporting context. Um, now, 
obviously this comes from the reporting lens, right? Which is one of our priorities to start off with. How do we meet these requirements? But it's a bit broader that when we get into the priority of what we're looking at. One of the primary areas we focused on um, is a requirement for some of the oil and gas industry members, but also other, you know, other organizations in the forum is facilitating data exchange between stakeholders, sharing data across joint venture partners, which I alluded to, but also looking at the integration of the data analytics into the reporting cycle. So it's not just about generating the report, but how do I then do the analytics on top of that data to identify and address data gaps? But also more importantly, starting to optimize, right? My emissions, <clears throat> excuse me, my emissions monitoring uh, and reduction strategies. Uh, we're looking at specific use cases, for example, in the manufacturing industry or sustainability analytics and forecasting for soil industry use cases. So there are a variety of areas where this can apply. And then obviously looking at automation schemes and things like generative AI to facilitate report construction alignment with these requirements. The last point, again, I want to stress, I won't go into too much detail, but it's very crucial. And this is a big part of how we've been rebuilding or extending the model is streamlining the data verification assurance processes, right? Rule sets, quality assessment guidelines, but also preparing data for external audit, which is obviously crucial um, when you get to the final reporting stage. Um, I'll leave it at that and move on to uh, to Sam, your portion of the presentation. Thank you, Bertrand, and hello, everyone. So just following through what Bertrand and uh, Jim has mentioned so far, um, let's take a look at the timeline. And this timeline is going to give you some insights on the history, what we have done uh, as Open Footprint, and then we will look at how that has enabled us to come to uh, where we are today and where Open Footprint is looking forward to for the next six to nine months. Um, the, if you look at the slide, it is divided into a top and bottom. The bottom part will focus on mainly the data model. And then the top part will focus on how we have uh, reached out to the market, what we have delivered and achieved and so on and so forth. At the very left side um, of the timeline, we start with uh, 2021 milestones and then 2022 milestones. And this is the main emphasis in this time uh, of, of our journey has been on the data model. So we started with the data model version one. Our focus, one, our focus was on scope one and scope two GHG calculation uh, mainly. We did some um, initial demos and reached out to, uh, to members who, who are with us right now. And then in 2022, we focused on enhancing that data model and make a version two of it, where we, we started looking into scope three GAG calculation, uh, including um, product carbon footprint. As we continued with the journey, you can see in 2023, tail end of 2023, we had a version three. So we enhanced the data model with version three and a lot of focus was given to unit of measure. At that point, we uh, started pulling in more of the other pollutants, uh, more than just GAG. And we also initiated looking at APIs. So how, how do we come up with a solution that can actually, uh, that can actually use this data model to, uh, to start exchanging data, uh, develop a process of interoperability. As we were working on the version three, uh, you can see on the top of the, uh, on the top part of the slide, we also worked on our first white paper. So September, 2023, that's when the first white paper was released. And as we moved along, uh, we moved on to the uh, 2024 year. This is where we started looking into enhancing the data model even further, uh, which was the version 3.1. And we looked at naming conventions. We looked at data model standards, uh, inventories, activity monitoring. So many other features of the data model that uh, expanded from the basic concept that we started uh, before. At the same time, we also aligned with WBCSD. That was another big win. Um, and then we continued to progress on the data model we created a snapshot and the snapshot was launched uh, this year in February. As we progressed, uh, we had our forum in April uh, this year, and this is where we landed on our data model version four. And this is what we are currently working on. 
And the target is by October, we should have uh, a data model and also a snapshot update uh, to, uh, to start looking into how can our members start using it. The target, the bigger target, uh, let's say January 2025, first quarter, the data model standard. So that is the bigger target that we have. Um, and you can see throughout the timeline, the data model prog progressed and we looked at a lot of the, the aspects that Bertrand alluded to. Um, as we were continuing with reaching out to the market with a white paper, snapshot, and also standards for the, for the data model piece. Okay. So uh, Jim, I'll hand it over to you for further information and uh, if there's any other uh, information that you wanted to cover from here. Yeah, I think Steve's gonna come back at this point and uh, we'll, we'll switch over to Q&A. So if any of the audience have any questions, feel free to submit those and uh, we'll try and get to those. Uh, meanwhile, if you are looking for further information, uh, this is where to find it, the Open Group Library and the uh, forum webpage. So. Yeah, so we'll, uh, this, this will be available to everyone who's registered as well, but it's just some quick links to, uh, to where you can find out more because obviously there's a, only a short amount of time to uh, uh, whet your appetite for these. So um, for now, thank you gentlemen for, uh, for, your, for your words and um, please come back and we'll have a, a Q&A panel and joining us as, as well will be uh, Heidi Carlson, uh, who is the director of the Open Footprint Forum here at the Open Group. So welcome, Heidi, and uh, welcome back, everyone. So, Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> good to uh, good to have you here. Thank you. And um, yeah, more information available. But um, Jim, you said at the at, at the beginning that you were making this link um, quite rightly between uh, what we're talking about today and the role of enterprise architects nowadays and what they need in their in their toolkit. So um, can you comment, I'll start with you, Jim, can you comment on um, companies that aren't used to dealing with emissions data and, and are now going to be forced to uh, to record it, report it, etc. Um, what are the um, what are the challenges that they that they find, and uh, is there any help for them in what we're doing here at the Open Footprint Forum? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the things that we hear from uh, the members in the forum who are uh, close to the market, the consultants and so forth, is that companies who are dealing with this are largely in what I call spreadsheet chaos mode, where they're using spreadsheets to collect data from the business partners for scope three emissions. Um, and realizing the difficulties in doing that and, and not having just simple things like standard field names and definitions and all the things that the model is designed to address. So, um, you know, com companies have had to just <laughs> sort of react and, and start doing something. Um, this is maybe a little more thoughtful approach. Uh, and clearly, um, particularly if you're a company that's not used to dealing with emissions, um, I think those companies are going through kind of a uh, realization that this is like creating a whole separate accounting system for non-financial data, you know, in this case, emissions data and, and other sustainability data. And it really requires thinking about it from really an enterprise architect sort of viewpoint. How do we do this the right way? You know, we standardize in the data, we create interfaces that allow more, e more easy data transfer so those sorts of things. So I think, you know, for me, the answer is very much yes. There's things in here that enterprise architects need to pay attention to as they uh, try and organize their companies for success in this area. Right, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, and, and Sam, presumably this is right, and given your given your uh, title and background, this is right in your area too. Do you, uh, you obviously you're with a company that's used to uh, reporting on emissions, I guess, but uh, can you can you add to to anything Jim said? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So, um, I think the the key here is what OFP is trying to build is the standard is a standard data model. Now, will there be work needed to um, align with that standard? Yes, of course. But the benefit of it is the alignment and the standard and speaking the same language as we uh, as we are trying to establish. So. 
uh, documentation will be key, how to and other um, assisting documents that can help companies to adopt this standard is going to be a key, a key thing for sure. Um, it's a it's a journey and, and we just have to take uh, step by step and see how we can move it forward. Right, right, Get, getting that help. So um, if I can come to um, you next, Heidi, um, you've been with the uh, with the forum from the from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about the, the the membership of that forum and and how we go about involving individuals from organizations in different geographies and uh, time zones? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so, yes, as you mentioned, uh, the the forum was established uh, four years ago. And from there, we have seen an uptick and an increase uh, multiplying every year, which has been fantastic from global organizations that are based um, throughout the world, as well as the members. So how we typically work is we have weekly meetings. Uh, we have different working groups that are dedicated to each portion of the project that needs to be completed. And depending on those skill sets, you know, those members may join one, two, or all of the working groups that we have. We have right now six. We're adding yet another one, possibly uh, around AI. And so uh, what we do is we hold these weekly meetings. Everyone is working together, which is just beautiful to see in the collaboration and the efforts. And uh, we have we try to. Uh, hold these meetings that will accommodate all the different time zones for the members that are based, uh, you know, from in, in Texas all the way around the globe to East Asia. So we have uh, quite a few that are joining us throughout the globe and uh, but it typically works well. And if if not, if they can't join, then we do typically record those meetings. So sessions so then the members can go in and they can listen and um, gain the 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 action items or the minutes um from that point and as you've heard there's there's lots of work to be done so um <clears throat> please do get involved wherever you are um we can we can use the help so yes. um question question for you uh i'll start with you at least bertrand if i may um we talked about the data model how do you see it affecting e the esg software solutions space yeah Thanks, uh, thanks, Steve. So my view on this, so you have a lot of providers out there provide, you know, with data, uh, sustainability data management platforms. What I see the open footprint data model standard impacting that is providing the standard data payloads from within organizations, moving away from, you know, these clunky and slow, you know, spreadsheet style data management that can then be provided and integrated with those existing ESG data platforms. So for example, collecting source parameter activity data, feeding those into the calculation engines that say um, an ESG platform provider has. So really coupling those integrations, I think this standard is, is gonna sort of pave the way for that type of, cu of coupling. And I think that's an important next step as far as the evolution of the standard and the forum of demonstrating those interoperability integration with existing ESG data platforms in the market. Okay. Good. So, so we can look, look forward to that. So, um, you talked about things that are out there now. There are also standards and frameworks in the sustainability area. <clears throat> now, obviously, as you explained earlier, we we uh, noticed a gap. Jim talked right at the top of the um, uh, of the session about uh, we noticed a gap. So, how is <clears throat> excuse me? How is the uh, open footprint data model? Uh, complementary to or different from other standards like um you know ghe protocol or uh, wbcsd that i think uh, you mentioned earlier so do you want to start with that jim or bertrand i'm happy to and feel free to chime in bertrand um so uh, there was deliberate work in the early days of the uh, open footprint forum to work with uh, wbcsd uh, they had done a lot of good work uh, in the area of uh, uh, product carbon footprint. Um, and uh, so th there's a deliberate attempt to align our data model with the work that they've done 
so that the scope three emissions that have to be collected from different organizations that, that can be more easily done, um, you know, in concert with them. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of just the, the fundamentals of the uh, data model, uh, the greenhouse gas protocol organization were uh, uh, instrumental in defining scopes one, two, and three, and what those meant. And so, you know, we stayed consistent with that and tried to reflect that inside of uh, the data model. Um, I'll also say that there's a, a pretty deliberate outreach attempt right now working with, to work with other standards organizations, get their input on the, the data model snapshot so that as we look to October and coming out with a revision to it, that we can incorporate feedback from these other organizations. So we encourage that feedback. And uh, uh, if you download the snapshot, the, the process for submitting those comments is, is there in the document. So. Okay, um, great. Yeah, a quick comment on that, uh, Steve. So the, this, this, this type of question has come up in the initial engagements that I've had with people looking at the value of the open footprint standard. And the first question that comes up is there's already so many standards and frameworks out there. What's, right. what's the purpose of a new one? And right. the answer that I gave that and the example I tried to give to that is those standards provide clear guidelines on, you know, how you need to be doing reporting, you know, what are the requirements? The data model, this, the OFP standard, right, is a data structure that it looks to apply to, to map to those, right, to, to facilitate that integration. And the sort of context that I give that the example is in the financial industry, you have various financial regulations in place. Then there are data standards and, you know, for example, for tax reporting, you know, how tax reporting software are put together then enable that alignment with those, those, you know, legal or other requirements. So that's on my view, others in the form as well. That's, that's the strong point of the data model and the data standard for fighting that alignment, which, you know, we've been, you know, pointing at throughout this, this talk, this toolkit Tuesday. Right. And it's, it's a great, great place to actually leave things. Cause it is a, effectively what you've just described is a tool to help um, deal with all, with all of this. And uh, here we are at toolkit Tuesday. So uh Good way, uh, good way of looking at it. Um, any last comments from anyone on uh, on anything here that you want to leave the audience with? I'm conscious of our time. Uh, we're we're up, but um, uh, I'll repeat. Yeah. I'd like to say I, something just quickly. So also, just because we have been um, working um, and every, all the members have been doing this for four years. It's it's still we still need a lot of assistance. Creating standards is a long process. And so don't be shy, jump in and because it's just a continuation of collaboration and as well as different perspectives from different industry sectors. That's what you know, we also need those perspectives. So Come on in. It's agnostic. Can't stress that enough. So uh, ho hopefully, we we will have some new interested uh, uh, parties to join. Great, great way to leave it. So, so uh, Jim, Sam, Bertrand, Heidi, thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. Oh, thank you. This morning for me. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you very Bye. much, and good luck with the uh, good luck with the work. So, folks, that's uh, that's it for today's main session. Um, we are going to have another special edition, um, actually, on June 11th. So, uh, about a month from now, um, we'll have a different topic and speaker or speakers to be notified uh, along the way. But you will, uh, as you registered for today, you will get uh, access to this presentation. These presentations um, uh, very shortly. You'll be notified when they're available. So. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks again to our to our speakers and panelists, and uh, I wish you uh, well wherever you are, and look forward to seeing you hopefully on June eleventh. Take care now. <laughs>